If you've ever used a security static code analyzer, you probably know how terrible they are. You're probably intimately familiar with false positives and false negatives, and there's a good chance you just stopped using the tool because of it. What if I told you that there is a math reason why static code analyzers have to be terrible. I will show you irrefutable proof on a whiteboard why security code analyzers will always throw false positives and or false negatives. And I also had the privilege of talking to the author of one of the most popular open source static code analyzers out there. So let's get into it. Hey, Travis, uh, do you want to start by introducing yourself? Hey, how's it going? I'm Travis. I'm a security generalist turned founder. I've been doing security things for 10 years, usually at big companies, and now I'm building a security company. Very awesome. And where were you before that? Databricks. And where were you before that? Netflix. Where were you before that? IBM. <laughs> Very impressive. I was in massive companies working my way smaller. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for hopping on a call. Um, the reason I wanted to talk to you today was to pick your brain a little bit about Bandit. So I guess just to start, um, what is Bandit? Bandit is a security linter for Python. And what is your relationship with Bandit? I was the initial creator of it, along with Jamie Finnegan. There was a group of us going around the table, like writing grep rules. And then uh, Jamie Finnegan actually like kind of got quiet and went in the corner and he came back overnight and had an AST based thing that was much more robust. And then I took that and really extended it out. Okay, I know security static analysis might not seem like the most interesting subject, but bear with me, I promise it gets interesting. I want you to imagine that you have a vulnerable function that if a program calls, it's gonna cause a bad security incident. We'll call this the RCE function. Next, I want you to imagine that we have a security analysis code scanner that can look at a piece of source code and instantly be able to know whether or not that source code invokes the RCE function. Last, we're going to write a kind of weird program that's entire goal is to wrap the code scanner. And if the code scanner says that it analyzes something and there's no call to the remote code execution function, the weird program is going to call the remote code execution function itself. And if the static analysis code scanner says that the thing that it's analyzing does have a call to the remote code execution function. It won't invoke the remote code execution function. Following me so far? Okay, so the last piece is we're going to feed the source code for the weird program into our code scanner. Let's think about the two possible outcomes. If the code scanner says that the weird program will run the remote code execution function, then by definition, the weird program won't run the remote code execution function. You might see the contradiction there. This contradiction is actual mathematical proof that you cannot create a code analyzer that can, in a generic case, know for certain if a piece of source code will invoke the remote code execution function. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's not possible to catch every everything. Now, I didn't invent this proof, and if you're looking at this and you think this is a little bit familiar, that's because this proof is actually the same proof for the halting problem. The halting problem is a famous problem that Alan Turing originally derived a proof for almost a hundred years ago. Basically, Alan Turing wanted to know if you could, in a general case, come up with a static code analyzer that could tell whether or not a function will loop forever or halt and stop running. He used the same proof I just showed here to show you can't, in a general case, ever know for certain by looking at a program whether or not that program will run forever or halt. All I did was modify that halting function with the remote code execution function. But I always found it so interesting that we now have an entire industry of companies coming up with static code analyzers, promising to find all of your security vulnerabilities, when a hundred years ago, we came up with a math proof saying that that is impossible to do. So this is why, you know, at the end of the day, all we can say is like, you're using a vulnerable pattern, not like you have an actual vulnerability.
So here's what ends up happening in practice. You have a static code analyzer that's uncertain about whether or not a program might invoke the RCE function. It now has a choice to report a vulnerability or to not report a vulnerability. If it reports the vulnerability and it turns out to be wrong, that that remote code execution function actually can't be invoked. We call that a false positive because the program positively reported a vulnerability that turned out to not be a vulnerability. If the program chooses to not report the remote code execution vulnerability, and it turns out the program invokes the remote code execution function, we call that a false negative because the static analyzer produced a negative result and it was wrong. And this is the existential problem that static code analyzers will always have. It doesn't matter how sophisticated we make that static code analyzer, how many machine learning models we use, how many people we have refining or tweaking rules, at the end of the day, each rule that we add to our static code analyzer has to make a guess as to whether or not a vulnerability might be executable in runtime. And you can make that guess as educated as you want it to be, you will never have a generic solution that will always tell you when the vulnerabilities are in your source code. That's how we end up with rules in static code analyzers that have some probability of throwing a false positive and some probability of throwing a false negative. Okay, let's talk about scale. What happens if we want to make a static code analyzer cover every type of vulnerability we can possibly think of? So we keep adding more and more and more and more to the scanner so that before we know it, it's looking for 100 things, 200 things, 300 types of vulnerabilities it's looking for. Let's pretend for a minute that every rule that this static code analyzer has, has less than a 1% chance of throwing a false positive. If we keep growing this code analyzer, by the time it has 500 rules, if each one of them have about a 1% chance of throwing a false positive, most of the time we run our static code analyzer, we're going to get false positives. And there is no way to construct a static code analyzer that doesn't have either false positives and or false negatives. And we know that because of the proof for the halting problem. Eventually you hit that wall where like the things you're adding are, are more likely to add false positive liabilities than than to add findings. Is that something that you ever felt yourself pushing up against? Or do you feel like, you know, you only had 30 rules, never had to deal with that, that larger scale problem? Yeah. So I think we never had the larger scale problem. You know, one thing is like, we weren't selling it. So if you're a commercial product, I can see the urge to get more and more features. We never really had that pressure. You know, there's a, there's definitely a trade-off point where you, you add a rule and it maybe fires like, you know, once validly, and then you get a ton of false positives on it. If you, if you break somebody's build and it's not, it's not an actual true positive, then folks get annoyed with it. They say, why is this thing here? And we would rather have a much better chance at catching real issues than have developers get frustrated and rip the thing out. So for, I guess, one of those larger vendors that, that sell huge static analysis tools that, that claim to, you know, solve all of your application security problems at the source code level. What's, I guess, what's your, your gut reaction to those, those types of tools? Snake oil. So if we just pause right there to recap, all static analysis code analyzers have a fundamental problem with scale. They can't avoid having false positives. And so whatever percentage chance each rule has that it will introduce a false positive, eventually, if you keep adding rules to your static code analyzers to look for more and more types of vulnerabilities, those will pile up to a point where your code analyzer throws false positives most of the time you run it. Alert fatigue is when a developer or a user gets so many alerts that eventually they just tune them out and stop paying attention to them. This is UX research that's been studied and well-documented for years. Browsers used to throw all kinds of alerts for potentially unsafe content that you're browsing to. 
And what happened was the users, after receiving so many of those alerts, ended up just turning them off. The same thing happens with web developers that get false positives from static code analyzers. I've seen it more times than I can count in my career. If a web developer gets the results from a static code analyzer and most of those results are false positives, eventually they're going to stop paying attention to the static code analyzer. What's your opinion on static analysis in general and what role that it fits into an application security team? Yeah, I'm really bearish on static analysis in general. Uh, the, at the time that you know we wrote Bandit, I was working at HP, and HP has Fortify, which is you know giant commercial product. And Fortify was uh, very slow, and it would take a lot of memory. You know, you couldn't run it like in any kind of a gate check job. So you know, you had to like throw it on this big instance. Um, I think you know static analysis. All you know, while you can do the tracing and the call graphs and all of that kind of stuff, um, a lot of times you don't get valid issues in that. I'm seeing that even today. And uh, it's also, you know, too slow to use it for the CI kind of stuff that I'm excited about. Okay, this is the part of the video where I tell you actually there is hope. There is a way to create static code analysis tools that aren't terrible. But we have to rethink the way we think about them. I think it's really common that when you're looking at the results of a static code analysis tool, you might think, well, why didn't you catch this thing? That is a toxic mindset. Rather than focusing on, let's try to detect everything, we need to focus on what is one thing that we can detect with 100% confidence. Meaning on that scale from false positives to false negatives, if we lean way into the false negative side of things and we introduce rules that are always confident but sometimes just miss certain findings, that enables us to scale, to keep adding rules that we're highly confident in. And sure, we're not gonna find everything, that's impossible, but at least the tool is usable and providing some value. It's finding things that we weren't finding before. Well, okay, how do we find results that don't have false positives in them? What would a human do? if they saw the output of a static code analysis tool saying that there was a vulnerability somewhere, they'd test it. They'd try it out and see whether or not they could hit that vulnerability in runtime. That's the approach that we take at Truffle Security. If we take our static code analysis tool that finds results and then we try them out in runtime to validate whether or not the issue is actually an issue. Are, are there any runtime analysis platforms that use static analysis to fuel the runtime analysis. I haven't seen any. That would be interesting. Do you want to know what the magic new formula is for the new truffle hog tool? Every single key that we identify through static analysis, every single one of them, all 700 keys, we actually test dynamically, automatically against the API provider that it belongs to, to see whether or not that key works. And this same formula doesn't just apply to keys. You could do the same thing for other bug classes. You could get, see if you got a shell, right? If you got the shell, then you know there's a shell that can be gotten. If you use the static analysis to guide where you looked for that shell, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, a lot of DAST uh, similarly almost takes like a black box approach. So it's like, you know, it, it's pretending like you don't have the source code. It would be pretty cool if you had some kind of coordination there. So you use your internal knowledge of how the application is actually written, and then you use that to guide, you know, your attacker, your attacker simulation. If you think you found a cross-site scripting vulnerability through static code analysis, you can send a headless browser request to that endpoint and see if it renders as arbitrary JavaScript. And then if we recondition the way we think about our results to only put our focus on the issues that have been dynamically validated and literally just ignore everything else, we end up with a tool that is infinitely scalable. You lose 
the false positive problem. Sure, you'll have some false negatives, but the tool now has room to grow and it can find newer and different types of vulnerabilities that we can do dynamic checks for. So look, why am I taking time to make this video in the first place? It's hopefully to reframe your thinking about static code analysis. It's never gonna find everything. And so you should never be upset about it missing something, but you should always be upset about it firing a false positive. That is something that we can remove from the tool. And the benefit of focusing on removing the false positives is then our tool can scale and we can continue to find more and more different types of issues without running into an alert fatigue wall, without our developers getting fed up with the results. If we focus on just high quality output and ignore what the tool might be missing, then we can bring constructive change to our organization and start squashing real world security bugs without anyone getting fed up with the output of our static code analysis tool. If you need further validation that this method works, download the latest version of Truffle Hog and set it to only verified results. And you'll be able to throw it at insanely large volumes of data and you won't have scaling issues. All those problems with triage and all those issues of having to go through so many false positives before you find one valid result, they're not an issue when we let the tooling do the checking for us.